All right, uh, good afternoon. This is our second set of notes from Chapter 10, uh, Theory of VLE, uh, Theory of VLE and Multi-Component Mixtures. In this set of notes, we will derive the Gibbs phase rule. So I know now that we've used the Gibbs phase rule extensively in this class, and we've brought it up a lot. Uh, one, because I find it a very valuable tool in terms of interpreting and reading phase diagrams. Uh, and now, following our last set of notes, where we derived our criteria of uh, phase coexistence and multi-component mixtures, we can derive this expression. Okay, I only hope that I don't disappoint you by the simplicity uh, of its derivation. Okay, but uh, let's go and see where the Gibbs phase rule comes from to give you an appreciation of where the expression comes from, um, and so maybe it'll give you new meaning um, once you go to use it. Okay, all right. So as I said, we've, we've used the Gibbs phase rule extensively uh, throughout this course, <clears throat> and now our goal here is, is to derive it. Okay? And so to remind you what the Gibbs phase rule is, right? it's the uh, Gibbs phase rule tells you the number of um, intensive, independent thermodynamic uh, properties that need to be specified to fix unambiguously the thermodynamic state of uh, my system. Okay? So um, F, number of independent intensive properties, is equal to N minus pi plus 2. Okay? And so, you know, to apply this for a couple different cases, if I had a single phase um, binary mixture, so I had a beaker uh, con consisting of a mixture of water and ethanol, okay, and I do a degree of freedom, de yeah, degree of freedom analysis, and the number of components is two, pi the number of phases is one, so two minus one is one plus two. I have three degrees of freedom. <clears throat> So what that would tell me is if I were to fix, or um, if I were to specify uh, three intensive thermodynamic properties, then the state of my system is fixed. In a case like that, for a single phase, what we would typically specify is mole fraction, right, where n minus one of the mole fractions are independent, so I'd have one independent mole fraction, plus temperature and pressure. I specify temperature, pressure, and composition. All right, cool, All right? Three independent uh, intensive thermodynamic properties. If I had a binary mixture, now a two-phase coexistence, okay? Well, in theory then, if I were to go through the same thought exercise that I just did of, oh, for each phase, I need, you know, to know uh, temperature and pressure, plus, you know, I have um, N minus one independent mole fractions. Well, so I'd have, you know, one mole fraction that need to be specified in each phase, that's two. Uh, and then also to have temperature and pressure, which I know will be uniform throughout, that gives me, you know, four degrees of freedom, okay? Well, it's not the case. If I were to go to the Gibbs phase rule for that two-phase binary system, number of components is two, number of phases is two, plus two, two, right? So what gives, right? Why do I need, you know, you know, fewer degrees of freedom than that thought exercise I just went from? And the answer to it's gonna be, that we'll go through on the next slide, is I have some constraints that I can impose, okay? So if I have, you know, two components in two-phase coexistence, my constraint is that the chemical potential of each species in each phase is equal to each other. So the chemical potential of species one in phase one and two has to be equal. Chemical potential of species two in phase one and phase two has to be equal to each other. So that gives me two constraint equations, which reduces the number of degrees of freedom to two. Okay, all right. Now let's go through our formal definition. Okay, or formal, not definition, derivation. So if we imagine we have n species in equilibrium in pi phases, okay? <clears throat> so um, if I have, you know, pi phases, then in each phase I'm gonna have n minus one independent mole fractions, okay? And I have n minus one independent mole fractions because I have this requirement or constraint that the mole fractions need to sum to one. So in terms of number of independent mole fractions, I have n minus one independent mole fractions in each phase, and then I have pi phases, so the total number of independent mole fractions is pi times n minus one, okay? Now I said I had you know n species in equilibrium in pi phases. In equilibrium, I have equality of temperatures and pressure throughout my uh, phases and coexistence. Uh, so the two corresponds to temperature and pressure. <clears throat> so if I have n species in equilibrium in pi phases, then to characterize my system, all right, I have two, temperature and pressure, plus pi times n minus one. This gives me the number of 
uh, independent mole fractions in my system. All right. But now if I'm in equilibrium, I also have this constraint requirement that the chemical potential of each species in each phase is equal, right? My isochemical potential requirement, okay? And so I could write my, you know, expression for an arbitrary species J as such, where I would expand this equality out all the way out to pi phases. Okay, so now if I were to break this up into independent or, you know, single equalities, okay, I could rewrite this as a system of pi minus one um, equalities, okay? And that'd be for each component, right? Why pi minus one? Well, if I was to go through the chain and say, you know, chemical potential of species J in phase one is equal to chemical potential of species J in phase two, uh, chemical potential of species J in phase three, or two is equal to chemical potential of species J in phase pi, okay? Um, that gave me, what, um, one, um, uh, two um, equalities, okay? I don't also need to say chemical potential of species uh, J in phase I is equal to chemical potential of species J in phase two, right? Because, you know, that would just result from uh, the difference in those uh, previous two um, equalities that I mentioned, right? So only of those three equations, only um, two of them are independent. The third is just a linear combination of the first two, okay? So for each species, I have pi minus one constraint requirements. So overall, since I have n components, and for each component I have pi and minus one constraint equations, these equality of chemical potential expressions, I have n times pi minus one constraints. Okay, so then where do we go from there? So the number of degrees of freedom that I have, so this is two, temperature and pressure, plus pi times n minus one, number of independent uh, mole fractions, minus n times pi minus one, minus the number of constraint equations that I have. So if I expand it out, it reduces to, Gibbs phase rule as we know it, f is equal to two minus pi plus n. Okay, so now you know the origin of the Gibbs phase rule. For a single phase, okay, if I just have a, you know, multi-component mixture, right, I would characterize that multi-component mixture using temperature, pressure, and uh, mole fraction of that system, right, where n minus one of the mole fractions are independent. So I have two plus n minus one, um, you know, variables that need to be specified. If I have pi phases at coexistence, well, in terms of number of independent mole fractions, I have pi times n minus one. I still just have two degrees of freedom corresponding to temperature and pressure, because the temperature and pressure in all those phases are uh, equal. And then I just apply my constraint requirement that I have equality of chemical potential between each species in each phase, okay? Once I account for my constraints, I get the actual number of uh, independent uh, intensive variables that need to be specified to uh, fix the state of my system, which is given by the Gibbs phase rule here. Okay. And the very last note uh, I'll make before we move on here, all right, that this derivation isn't limited to just systems at uh, constant T and P, um, but you could take this and you could, you know, much more generalize uh, the result.